Good morning. Welcome to worship at Fourth Presbyterian Church on this Lord's Day. You know, it's kind of fun from up here to watch the patterns and um, to see, you know, on any given Sunday. So this Sunday, y'all are really packing it in on this side, and you've even bumped some of your this-siders over to that side. It kind of reminds me when I was growing up, my church was, uh, we used to joke about the saved and the unsaved sides of the congregation. So... <laughs> So I don't know, maybe y'all are missionaries if you got bumped over, missionaries to that side, or maybe y'all are working on them, I don't know. But uh, anyway, good to see y'all here this morning and uh, to be in worship in God's house together. There's a lot to uh, talk about coming up in our life together. And to start with, we're going to have Hank give us a minute for mission about the bulletin blurb called A Place at the Table. So I was sitting trying to figure out which side was saved and which wasn't. <laughs> I think I'm going to withhold judgment on that. <laughs> I'm excited to stand before you this morning as the staff liaison from the Member Engagement Committee to invite you to an exciting day here at Fourth on October 6th, which is World Communion Sunday. We're doing an event that day that's called A Place at the Table, and we will be offering to church members the opportunity to explore new ways of putting their faith into action. At 10 a.m. that day, we will have only one worship service on October 6th. It's going to be a musical observance of the Lord's Supper with a guest composer named Tom Trenny. This service will be the culmination of a weekend of rehearsals with the choir on six pieces of Tom's music, one of which that has been commissioned especially for this event. Following worship, we'll move to the Fellowship Hall for a delicious church-wide brunch and a short video program that celebrates the many mission opportunities that we support as a church. After that, representative from various church committees will be available at display tables in the Fellowship Hall and in the area surrounding in order to answer questions of how you may get involved in ways that perhaps you haven't been before. I want to emphasize that this is not about joining committees, though that is an option that would be available. We know that how we act upon our faith can look a lot of different ways. For some, it may be serving in a disaster relief mission project. For others, it may be tutoring at Sterling or serving as a greeter, bringing cookies to vacation church school or sharpening pencils in the pew racks. Every act of faith, no matter how big or small, brings us closer to the heart of God and brings God closer to our hearts. You're going to be receiving a mailing in the next few days about this event, as well as seeing it in the e-blast and the bulletin, on the scrolling announcement monitors, and on Wednesday night fellowships and other church events. You're going to be hearing a lot about it because our church officers feel that acting on our faith is an important part of having faith. There will be multiple ways for you to RSVP for your place at the table, including online or email or even by paper registration. If you are as excited as I am about this event and want to reserve your place or places at the table that day, I even put paper sign-up sheets on the host table this morning. They can simply be left with the host or on the table. I promise you that day a worship experience that you will not soon forget. And I hope that we can carry that excitement, that privilege of sharing the Lord's table, especially on World Communion Sunday, into making a visible commitment after the brunch, after the brunch that day. Maybe of doing just one more little thing to put our faith into action. We will have child care and activities for the children so that parents can take their time and explore all of the ways to put faith into action here at Fourth. I thank you for your attention and I ask for your prayers for a place at the table. And I will see you in October as we take our places at God's table on World Communion Sunday. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. And speaking of opportunities, there is a big box on the back of the bulletin today with mission opportunities that are coming up with some important dates, uh, lots of different ways to be a part of the work of Fourth um, here in the community. 
Um, also, thinking about worship attendance and, and, and times, um, this is the last Sunday of the summer worship schedule. Next Sunday, August the 25th, we will return to our normal schedule uh, with worship at 845 and 1115 and Sunday school in between um, at 10 a.m. We'll be continuing our, continuing our Summer of Psalms series. We had another outstanding uh, lesson this morning. Thanks to Elliot Grove for that. Uh, we'll continue that series um, into September for a bit, um, but, but, but our worship schedule will change next week. Um, hopefully you'll, we'll all remember that. Uh, church retreat is coming up in September. Is also on the back of the bulletin. Uh, on the inside of your bulletin, you'll see a new member Sunday scheduled for September the 22nd. So if you've been considering joining with us, that is an opportunity for you. Um, as well as a number of other uh, things that we'd like you to take a look at there in, in the bulletin. So lots going on, lots of ways to be a part of the life and ministry of Fourth Church. I believe those are all of the announcements, so let us turn our hearts and our minds now to the worship of God. Please stand as you are able and as we join together in the call to worship. Gathered together before the word, font, and table, we remember the humility of Christ. Gathered together before the word, font, and table, let the same mind be in us that was in Christ Jesus. Gathered together before the word, font, and table, we proclaim the story of our faith, humility, death, resurrection, and exaltation. Gathered together before the word, font, and table, we worship the name above every name, Jesus Christ our Lord.
You may be seated. Jesus calls us to be perfect because our Heavenly Father is perfect. Another way to say this is to be whole because our Heavenly Father is whole. We know how far we fall short of this calling in Christ. We know our lives are broken, fragmented, and incomplete. Thankfully, Christ, who was in the form of God, chose to empty himself, to humble himself, opening for us the way to humility. So following his example, let us humble ourselves as we join together in the prayer of confession. Let us pray. Righteous God, we confess that we have not lived as your obedient children. We have honored you with our words, but we have denied you with our actions. We have not pursued the mind of Christ, who took the form of a servant, for we have acted with selfish ambition. We have put our interests before the interests of others and have not regarded them in humility. Forgive us our arrogance, awaken our hearts to sincere repentance, and enable us to will and to work for your good pleasure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Though we were enemies of God, Christ has called us and made us friends. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We are set free for new life and joyful obedience. So may we be at peace with God and with one another. Amen. May be seated and children I would like to invite you forward to join me for a special time together hello everyone and welcome good to see you all today come and fill on the pew first and then we'll move to the floor all right everyone all right good to see you all I want to begin this morning by asking you a question all right this might be a tough one okay what is love any ideas what is love hmm say it again your heart that's right love is in our heart what do you think love is relationship Ooh, that's good Oh, when you care about someone, that's right. Any ideas and other ideas about what love can be? Anyone? Friendship, that's right, our friends. Well, I read something this week that made me giggle a little bit. See, uh, someone asked a group of children what love is. Now, you all gave wonderful answers, and so did these children, but some of them made us giggle a little bit. Let me tell you what some of these children said love was, okay? This is someone who was um, five years old. She said, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on cologne and they go out and they smell each other. (laughs) 
<laughs> All right, love. Now, this one made me giggle because this describes my love and relationship with my husband, Jeremy. This person was eight years old. He said, love is when you go out to eat and somebody gives you most of their French fries without making you give them any of their French fries. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, here's another. Love is when you tell someone you like, they sh you like their shirt and they wear it every day. Hmm. This, is, this is maybe my favorite. Love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left him alone all day. Oh. <laughs> okay, here's another. This person um, was seven. She says, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my, grandf my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. <laughs> and then this one, this is by a girl named Haley. She was six years old. And she said, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend who you don't like to play with. Oh, yeah, Haley's right. So as we continue to think about love and what love might be, all of these answers are good. All of these answers get close. But as Christians, we know something even more about love. We know that love comes from where? Where does love come from? Who does love come from? God, yes. Love comes from God, and we know that because we have Christ Jesus who showed us the best example of love we could ever have. And because of Jesus, we know that sometimes love is hard, right? Like what Haley said. I think she really gets it. If you want to love better, you should start with a friend you don't like to play with. Those are the people that challenge us to know how to better love. So um, that's the kind of love that's made possible only by God. And that's the kind of love that I want us all to to be in our hearts this week as we try to figure out how do we love God and how do we love one another. Remember to play with those who challenge us, maybe those we don't like to play with as much. Let's keep our hearts and minds open for the love of God. Why don't we stand up together in a circle, say a repeat after me prayer. All right. You can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for your love. Help us to love others, even when it's hard. Help us to follow Jesus. Amen. Thank you.
Draw us close, Holy Spirit, as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed. Let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts, and let all other words slip away. May there be one voice we hear today, your voice of truth and grace. Amen. Our gospel reading for today comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. Hear now God's word. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Our next reading for today comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through, I think your bulletin says 11, but I'd like to go through 13. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The power of love. When you hear those words, what comes to mind? Chances are it's one of two songs. And as Pastor Mike and I discovered this week, the song that springs to your mind is likely related to your age. (laughs) You see, when I told him that I was considering naming this week's sermon, The Power of Love, he broke out into a hearty rendition of, Power of Love is a Curious Thing, (laughs) by Huey Lewis and the News. Now, I'll admit that they were before my time, and I had to Google them and that song. (laughs) When I think of the power of love, I think of the 1995 hit by Celine Dion. Anybody else? Okay. I know I'm young. (laughs) Now, you may be wondering, what do these songs have to do with today's message? Well, not much, except that they have a great name, (laughs) the power of love. Over the last week, I've spent a lot of time thinking about love because that was the theme of the Montreat Women's Conference that I attended last weekend. It was a privilege to spend a weekend with 500 other women, some from Forth and others from as far away as Arkansas and Connecticut. 
We explored what love feels like and looks like and what love does. And one of the truths that we explored was that while love is often painted to be sweet, passive, and nice, the love of God in Christ Jesus is actually not passive at all. It's active, revolutionary, and very powerful. Powerful enough to tear down barriers between enemies, powerful enough to erase hatred, powerful enough to create joy, peace, and hope, and powerful enough to build a kingdom, the kingdom of God on earth. Today's gospel lesson from the book of Matthew recounts a small portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, in which Jesus explains the difference between two kingdoms, the earthly kingdom and the kingdom of God. Several verses prior to this passage, Jesus explains that in the earthly kingdom, the rule is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. In other words, settle the score, get revenge, give your enemies what they deserve. It's only fair. But then Jesus presents his way, the way of God's kingdom. Love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. In other words, don't worry about getting even. Follow my example. Be perfect, he says, as your heavenly Father is perfect. No pressure, right? (laughs) The word perfect, in this case, stems from the Greek word telos. It's the word for goal, or end, or purpose. The sense of the word is more about becoming what was intended for us, maturing, growing into our true identity. Even still, growing into our identity as bearers of the image of God is a high bar. At the Montreat Women's Conference, we had the honor of hearing from Valerie Kaur. She's a civil rights activist, a lawyer, filmmaker, educator, and author. You may remember that our pellet worm lecturer, Dr. Adrian Bird, showed us a clip of Valerie during his lecture on the Sikh religion. Her most recent project is called Revolutionary Love, which was born out of her experience of giving birth to her children. She uses birth as a metaphor for the revolutionary power of love and reminds us that when darkness swells around us, we must consider the possibility that it is the darkness not of the tomb, but of the womb. She says that when confronting pain, suffering, hatred, fear, grief, and all that threatens us, we must push through the pain to birth a new future. She says that love breaks down barriers, erases hatred, and writes a new story. Now, I'll confess that while hearing her speak, I found myself thinking, sounds great in theory, but nearly impossible in practice. I mean, when I look around at the deep divides between people, the competing arguments and opinions, the anger and vitriol, I seriously question whether or not love can be the answer. Speaking of love being the answer, I'm reminded of our church's confirmation retreat back in April of this year with our funny, bright, insightful students. At the retreat, our leader held several group discussion sessions, and together we explored questions of faith, theology, and life. Over the course of the weekend, there seemed to be one answer that found its way into every discussion, and that answer was given over and over again by Lads Goldsmith. Now, don't worry, I asked his permission to share this story. But our leader would ask a question like, Who is God? And lads would reply, love. What does God look like? Love. How do we live out our faith? Love. (laughs) It got to the point where we were all getting tickled during every question because we knew that lads would chime in with love. And every time he was right, love became the refrain of the weekend. You know, when we think about it, it's just that simple, right? And yet, it's just that difficult. One of the stories Valerie Kaur told us was about a man named Balbir Singh Sodi. Balbir was a close family friend, and Valerie called him uncle. 
Now we learn from Dr. Adrian Bird that Sikh men wear turbans as a sign of their deep commitment to love and hospitality. When a Sikh wears a turban, he is letting everyone know that if they are hurt or in need, the Sikh will be there to help. When he wears that turban, he is committing to act with peace and healing and forgiveness. However, following the horrific 9-11 attacks, many Sikhs were confused for Muslims and became the targets of numerous hate crimes. Uncle Balbir was a victim of one of those hate crimes. And four days after 9-11, he was shot in the back while planting flowers outside of a gas station that he owned. Fifteen years later, Valerie and Uncle Balbir's brother, Rana, decided to test their own ability to love their enemy by making a phone call to prison and speaking with the man who had killed Uncle Balbir. Through that conversation, eventually the man who shot Balbir said, I want you to know from my heart I'm sorry for what I did to your brother. One day when I go to heaven to be judged by God, I will ask to see your brother, and I will hug him, and I will ask him for forgiveness. Rana answered, we already forgave you. He told the man that if he could take him out of prison now, he would, and that if he ever does leave prison, they can go together and tell the whole world their story. Their phone conversation was not an end, but a beginning. It opened the door to reconciliation and a new chapter in their story. Now, it didn't erase the painful past, but it labored for new life, a new path forward. As we consider the world in which we live, the news reports we hear daily, the competing ideologies and theologies, the cycles of violence, the never-ending debates, it's easy for us to become exhausted, and perhaps even jaded. How many times have we thought, well, that's just the way the world is, or nothing's ever going to change? But that's not kingdom talk. What if we dared to believe Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount or Paul in his letter to the Philippians? What if we decided to cling to the ethic of love and trust in its power in our daily interactions, in our church, in our communities, and in our world? What would that look like? Valerie Kaur suggests that it begins not with dramatic displays like calling an enemy in prison, but rather with wonder and curiosity. It begins with asking about those who disagree with us, or those who challenge us, or those who hurt us. What wounds do they have? What has shaped them into the person that they are? What are they grieving? What scares them? And we are to ask those questions not in order to better build up our arguments against them, but because we are eager to connect with them beyond the division. I once heard Barbara Brown Taylor say that when she meets someone with whom she feels she cannot connect, she searches for the thing that brings them both to tears. What points of brokenness can be our connection? What common experiences have we shared? What tragedies have they suffered? What about their journey can help to enlighten our own path? And when we approach one another with wonder and curiosity, we are working toward love and away from fear or hatred or disgust. Wonder and curiosity are the starting point. Not our factual arguments, not our opinions, not even our theology. Wonder and curiosity. When disagreements and offenses are as thick as a jungle and you find yourself wondering how to find the narrow path of Christ, begin with wonder and curiosity. That's the portal for revolutionary love. After all, it was God's wonder about humanity's pain that led God to become Emmanuel, God with us. It was Christ's wonder about humanity's pain that led him to humbly sacrifice himself. It was that love, that wonder, that led Christ all the way to the cross, sacrificing self for the sake of unity and relationship. 
You know, when I read Paul's letter to the Philippians this week, I wondered what it might look like if Paul wrote to us, Fourth Presbyterian Church, a letter. Instead of a book of Philippians, what if there was a book of Fourthians? (laughs) What would he say to us today in our language? Now, I'm no Paul, but after a careful look at the Greek and a prayerful meditation on the joys and challenges of this congregation, here is what I think that letter might sound like. My dear friends and siblings in faith, how deeply I love you. If you've learned anything from Christ, if his love has any power in your life, if life together in the community of the Spirit means anything to you, then make joy burst forth in my heart by doing this. Choose to stick together when it's difficult. Don't let your ideas and opinions tear you apart. Choose love over being right. Rise above society's clamor and choose the way of love and deep friendship. Err on the side of grace and mercy. Outdo one another in love. When an argument threatens your connection, be quick to humble yourself and lift the other up. Think of yourself the way Christ thought of himself. Even though he had equal status with God, he laid aside the advantages of that status and took on the status of a slave. He humbled himself to the point of becoming human. He claimed no special privileges. He lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. Although he suffered earthly defeat, he became exalted by God, lifted high so that all creation will one day bow before him. All creation will praise him. What I'm trying to say, my friends, is that love is worth the struggle. If you want to taste the glory of salvation, you must keep at this difficult work. Reach deep and sense God's holy energy inside of you. That is what will give you the power to transcend the ways of the world and choose the path of revolutionary love. May this be so. Amen. I now invite you to stand and join us in singing hymn number 727. Please note that we'll be singing only verses 1, 3, 4, and 5.
So let us remain standing and affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Friends, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. In mentioning and jesting about the different sides of the congregation that we sit on, I'm reminded of the deep Christian friendship that we shared in my church growing up, in which those jokes were made, and that we share today. That regardless of where we sit in this sanctuary, we sit all around this one table. As we present our gifts today, it is in the faith that God is at work in all of us and in this community uh, in a spirit of Christian friendship that comes to us through the example of Christ. It is in our commitment to that spirit that we offer our gifts this day. Let us present our offerings to God. You may be seated. Let us join our hearts in prayer. 
Our Father in heaven, you make the sun to rise on all the people of the earth, on those who love and care for their neighbors, and on those who commit atrocities in every evil act. You send rain to water the earth, pouring out blessing on those who speak words of love and peace and welcome, and those who speak words of mockery, derision, and even hatred. You love those who love you in return, and you love those who consistently and actively turn their backs on you, those who gather to sing your praise and receive your love, and those who deny your very existence. We gather today with thanks in our hearts that your love is the greatest power at work in this world. As those immersed in the power of your love, we arise from the waters of our baptism to align ourselves with your purposes revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so we praise you even as we pray for all your children, our brothers and sisters to whom we belong in the body of Christ and in the human family. We pray for those locked in circumstances beyond their control, restrained by oppressors, seeing no end to their captivity. May they discover hope buried in deepest suffering through Jesus Christ, who shared the weakness and despair of human life, yet gave even death a new outcome and brought resurrection from a closed tomb. In light of this hope, in the midst of such a world, we pray for your church, which you set in the world to show that people belong together and how people belong together, and how your gifts are given to be shared with one another. Teach us to meet you and all our neighbors and to find the ways that your love is at work to transform us. We pray for the communities in which we live and work and play, for people under stress and un unable to deal with their difficulties, for those who seek comfort in ways that bring no help. For all who live in fear. For those who feel there is no time to rest and relax and be playful. Give us grace to show by our words and by our deeds how you love and value each person in our community. Eternal and faithful God. We remember those whose lives on this earth have come to their conclusion, those hidden from us now but at home with you. We give thanks especially for those who have strengthened our faith, built up our trust in you, and by their lives have drawn us into the life of Christ, who died in weakness and now reigns in glory. It is in his strong name that we offer this and all our prayers, praying as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
people of God, let us recommit ourselves to love. When arguments arise, let us cling to wonder and curiosity. As you go throughout this difficult yet simple work, know that the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with you today and in every tomorrow. Amen. Thank you.